This is Ty A.K., the Flip Man, and welcome to this week's Flippinar. We're live on Facebook. Uh, we're live on YouTube. Um, I had to rig this up, so it's not going to be the same quality if you were logged on to the actual uh, Flippinar or through any, any meeting. But I welcome everyone. I won't be able to comment on Facebook or and or uh, YouTube be too much. Um, but uh, again, I welcome everyone on the uh any meeting platform on youtube live and facebook live uh if you're not aware who i am i am the flip man um, i have a youtube channel i have over 200 videos there that uh gives just raw information about uh, wholesaling houses um and how you can do so and well, really wholesaling real estate and how you can do so without any cash or credit that's the name of the game so Hopefully we won't have any technical uh, uh, difficulties. We'll be able to flow right through. So we'll go ahead and get started again. Welcome uh, YouTube Live and Facebook Live to uh, this week's Flippinar uh, with the Flip Man. So let's go ahead and let me share my screen. Boom, uh, there we go. Let's get to the beginning of it. All right, so tonight's topic, how to wholesale apartments with no cash or credit. Yes, everybody knows that you can do it with houses. Uh, everyone knows that you can do it with um, um, uh, even mobile homes, but you know, you start to get into the commercial realm when you start talking about apartments. And I'm gonna go through some of the, uh, the basics of, of doing just that and what some of the differences are compared to houses. Again, if you're not familiar with uh, my platform and the process here, hello, Shanice in uh, DC. Um, not familiar with the process here. We basically, uh, i tell you a little bit about me and how I got started, a few other things, and um, I have some house cleaning about some of the other things that um, I've offered through my YouTube channel and other uh, platforms. But, um, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm not having any issues on Facebook Live and or YouTube Live, uh, but um, we're here. Uh, I rigged it up, <laughs> so uh, we're going to roll with this. I'll keep announcing the YouTube Live and the Facebook Live because some people come on like, you know, what, what, what is this guy? Who is this guy? So I'll keep um, uh, reiterating that throughout the actual Flippinar. So tonight's topic, again, how to, how to wholesale apartments with no cash or credit all right before we get started do a little house cleaning um suggest about attorney obviously you're not going to make ten thousand dollars if you don't do anything uh most people understand that so we don't have to actually go through that again so uh that's just a simple disclaimer uh don't let me forget i'll give away two free courses at the end of this uh flipinar. Um, I'll choose a call-in um, uh, participant and a chat room participant, someone that's logged on. So don't let me forget after the question and answer period. Have an apartment. I'm talking about apartments tonight. Uh, have this apartment building in uh, the Ohio area. Uh, you want to download more information about it, go to apartmentsforsale.net. That's A-P-T-S forsale.com a prop apartments abbreviated so that's a p t s that's a is an apple p is in paul t is in tom s is in sam forsale.net apartments forsale.net i'm offering a ten thousand seven hundred fifty dollar finder's fee for a buyer this just became available today i doubt this will last long but i just wanted to make you all aware of that hello taylor in miami all right, um, if you're not aware, again, if this is the first time you're ever coming across me, uh, I, I would challenge you to find someone that has more free content, more useful actual stuff that you can put into motion and actually make money from than I do on the topic of wholesaling houses through my YouTube channel. Over 200 videos. I, if I'm talking about a pretty particular topic, I'm gonna tell you what I know about it. So uh, you can access that at flipman.net. Just do a search for the Flipman on YouTube. Please subscribe to my channel and turn on the notifications so you can get immediate alerts when I upload new uh, videos, new tutorials, 
and actually when I go live on YouTube. Follow me on Instagram, flipman.net. Follow me on Twitter, the Flipman. You see the handles here. Again, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Turn on the notifications. If you want a free copy of the one-page contract that I have used for the last 14 years and continue to use, you can access those. Uh, you can access that contract by simply texting the word contract to 31331. Uh, that's contract to 313131. Do not text me. Text the number 313131. No area code is needed. Treat it just as you would as a phone number and text the word contract. I actually talked to a young lady tonight. Uh, she's considering bringing me to her town uh, for coaching. So that is an option. People ask for it. I'll make it available. So just text me on the uh, fee on what it would cost. And uh, I'll be happy to do that. You see my phone number here on the screen. If you are interested in wholesale and commercial real estate, which we'll get into apartments, but I'm talking about triple net single tenant buildings, you can know you can go to flipthisbuilding.com, flipthisbuilding.com, low competition, uh, virtually, uh, you can do it virtually, send it at your laptop PC, a sea of opportunity because you can target the entire country, no cash or credit needed. Big fat paydays, flipthisbuilding.com. You need a private money list. The name speaks for itself, privatemoneylist.net, 400 private money lenders being added. And it also includes a bonus of 40,000 cash buyers nationwide. My goal here tonight, uh, again, if you've never heard of me and um, never heard of wholesaling houses, my goal here tonight, whether you're involved in real estate already or this is your first introduction, my goal here tonight is to introduce you to the method of wholesaling real estate, which it doesn't take any cash or credit to, uh, to actually put deals together. What is wholesaling? I'll just give you the actual definition that I pulled up. I just Googled it, you know, just so I can have something to read out and then I'll explain it through some actual numbers. Real estate wholesaling is a similar is similar to flipping, except that the time frame is much shorter and no repairs are made to the home before the wholesaler sells it. A real estate wholesaler contracts with a with a home seller, markets the home to his potential buyers, and then assigns the contract to the buyer. Let's do some numbers on that. So in layman's terms, before we get into the numbers. That basically means you place a property on the contract and that gives you temporary control of the property. You don't own it, but just some temporary control, meaning they can't sell it to anyone else. You place the property on the contract and then you assign uh, that property, that contract over to a cash buyer. I'm going to explain it just by some simple numbers. I should have done this in the earlier ones, but hey, I'm just, I'm improving on this, uh, hopefully, and it's getting better, hopefully. All right, let's just use an example here. We'll just say a house. Um, is in excellent condition would be worth $100,000. Okay, and what I mean by that, when it's fixed up, that's what it would be worth. That's what it would appraise for. For whatever reason, you can get this house on the contract for $30,000, okay? And, uh, well, some people, I uh, guess the question is, why would someone do that? Okay, it could be any number of reasons. Number one, they're going to be motivated to do it. And some of the reasons why, um, job relocation or just relocation period loss of income or job tired of being a landlord too many repairs uh can't afford the taxes on the property uh divorce uh any any number of reasons uh medical bills on a medical uh situation where you your insurance is not going to cover all of it um kid going off to college it goes on and on. IRS uh, troubles, it goes on and on. So they're motivated to sell and they need to sell quickly. So they have to give you a sell quickly price. All right. So we'll say the number is $35,000. So you place that property on the contract with the seller for $30,000. Now you then will advertise that property, we'll say at $45,000. So you market two cash buyers through different methods. Even if you had a list or you didn't have a list of cash buyers, for $45,000. One buyer steps forward and said, hey, 
after viewing the property, he'll pay you 41,000 and close in a few days. So now uh, you will have the opportunity to place the property under contract with the seller. I mean, with the, with the buyer, another contract for $41,000. So now you have contract A for 30,000, contract B for 41,000, which I should have put that on the screen, but I'll, I'll have that next week. All right, so whenever you go to close on the property, the seller gets their $30,000, which is what you all agreed upon, and you get the difference, which is $11,000. That is your fee. That is your assignment fee, whether you double close or whatever you do. That is your actual fee. Is this something you should be doing? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Student in Memphis, which I actually have a video of this on my YouTube channel, um, that he advertised on Craigslist that he buys houses. Uh, a couple that were moving out of state, I think from Memphis to some part of Texas, they responded. They bought a property as an investment property, but they never got around to repairing the property. So they were moving out of town. They were relocating. So they needed to liquidate the property quickly. So my student placed it under contract. He then uh, advertised the property and he found a buyer basically within a 27 day period from the time that he placed it under contract till he closed on it. So 27 days, he picked up a check of $6,444.40. If you just do the return on the base investment based on the $10 that he invested by uh, with the earnest money deposit to lock up the, the agreement, the contract, the return on investment, the ROI, is 64,344%. That's a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous return on investment. All right. Another student in Baltimore, which I have a video of this on my channel also, of this interview with him, found properties through a bandit sign campaign. They only put out a few. That's normally not how it works, but you, you never know. Uh, some action is better than none. So that he basically gave the, the seller one dollar, a one dollar in his money deposit. Actually, when he offered the one dollar, the seller uh, actually started to pull out uh, money. Uh, started to actually pull out um, a dollar. Hold on, one, one, just one second, guys. My one of my one of my uh, cameras is losing power. One second. Okay, I'm back. But um, so his return on investment, he had to split it with a partner, but the total deal was for thirty-two thousand. So he took sixteen thousand. So the actual amount that he received was sixteen thousand, but at the total deal, the return on investment is three million one hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred percent. Basically, an infinite uh, rate of return. Okay, so. You get the point that there, there's an opportunity to make some money here. Okay, well, who am I? How did I get started in, the, in this deal? I've always been an entrepreneur first, and real estate is just the one of the two or three ways I've only I've ever made any money of any significance. I'm not one of these people that uh, has been an entrepreneur all their life since they were a kid selling uh, lemonade or garbage bags or whatever, homemade cookies or whatever. I'm a late bloomer, in my, I guess, in a sense. Um, I didn't get interested in, in into uh, entrepreneurship until my early 20s when I was in college. And I'm not even sure where the bug came from, but once you get it, it's just so difficult to shake. 
So uh, with that being said, one of the first things that I ever did was um, I had the brilliant idea that I was going to take my student loan money, some of it, and buy used cars and become a millionaire. All right, I got an actual dealer's license. I'm not even sure how I figured out how to do that. And I don't know how we figured out a lot of things before the internet, but which that was uh, in the early 90s. And so um, um, I got a dealer's license, started going to dealer's auctions. And you would go to an auction, there'd be hundreds of cars out there. A car could be 10, 15 years old, and it'll be it'll look brand new off the showroom floor. So um, the problem with that is, if you're not mechanically uh, inclined or very knowledgeable or have someone working with you, that is, you're going to get hosed, and you're going to get hosed frequently. That was the case for me. So I failed at doing that. The next thing that I did of any significance was um, I started a mobile car wash with um, uh, from got the idea from at, well after going to Black uh, Beach Weekend in Daytona Beach, 1995. One of my brother's friends met us there from Orlando, and he had been doing it a, a, a couple of years and was doing six figures uh, with the mobile car wash business. So I couldn't wait till I got back to Birmingham. Bought a uh, a baby blue uh, passenger van with the seats that had been removed for 900 bucks. So you can only imagine how that looked. Uh, bought a 100-gallon uh, water tank and bought a pressure washer. I was in business. So I started going to barber shops, to uh, hair salons, to places of employment of people I knew. I had a little sign that I would put out once I started working. And my cousin and a, a, a childhood friend of, of mine, we, hey, we were out there getting it. And that was in the summer, spring and summer of uh, 95. But once it got cold, um, <laughs> uh, water and 40 degree temperature, or even 50 or 60 degree temperature doesn't mix, not with me at all. So I, I, I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I couldn't do that. All right, so fast forward, got into some multi-level network marketing things, really never made any money with any of that. The last thing that I was involved in before I got into real estate was uh, prepaid legal, which I think is called Legal Shield now. And what happened was that uh, one of my friends and his now wife were going to school to pump, uh, become realtors. And the guy that normally taught the uh, real estate class uh, wasn't there. And the substitute that replaced him that night, he didn't talk about being a real estate agent. He talked about investing in real estate. And so uh, my friend uh, told me about some of the things that the guy was talking about, which he was talking about creative ways of investing in real estate. So that, that intrigued me. So I didn't act on it at that time. That was 2002. Of, uh, of October of 2002. So a couple of months later, I was at my mom's house um, for, um, for for Christmas. And uh, I was up early one morning, actually December 27th. And she was preparing breakfast for me, uh, biscuits. You know, it was my favorite uh, biscuit to serve. I didn't need any meat or anything. Um, not that important, but I just thought I'd bring that up. But anyway, and I was watching uh, TV. And one of Carlton Sheets, I just flipping the channels and I caught one of these uh, No Money Down commercials with his real estate uh, course. And, you know, I had already seen them over the years. And you know, like most people, you're like, yeah, right. You know, this stuff doesn't work. And so I said, let me find it from beginning to end, which it didn't tell you anything. It just testimony. People say, I made this much money. I made this much. But it didn't tell you how they made the money. So after watching it from beginning to end, I thought to myself, uh, he can't be lying about all of this. All right. So from there, uh, my mom at that time didn't have Internet. So I waited till I got back to Birmingham and I went to this uh, entrepreneurial message board. I used to uh, frequent online and ask a question. Uh, Does Carlton Sheets program really work? And one person replied, uh, yes, it does. But um, Ron Legrand's course is better. So I did a search for Ron's course. And at that time, uh, he was selling his package for fifteen hundred dollars, and I still had a job at that point. That was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money, but it definitely was a lot of money back then. And so um, 
I couldn't afford that. So uh, search is on the site a little more. He had a condensed version of the course for $69.99 that was shipping it with 80 bucks. So I received that in cassette tape form. So you know how long ago this was. And it wasn't enough information where you could figure out how to do a deal, but it did let you know that this is something, hey, that I can do. And so uh, I had made up in my mind if I had to get a second job, I would. And uh, to save that $1,500 to get to get the uh, complete course. So a um, couple of days later, I thought about eBay and uh, I did a search for his name and a couple of his courses, pa course packages were up for auction. And so I bid it on one of the uh, uh, auctions and I lost. And the guy that was running the auction, he emailed me and asked me, would I like to get a burnt version, a, a CD copy of the uh, of, of the courses? You know, back then, I guess you could do that with eBay. And so, uh, which I'm sure they, they clean it up, but back then you could. And so um, we agreed on $400 and I got the course. It took me about three weeks to go through it because it was on wholesaling houses, lease options, uh, retailing, which is buy, fix and flip. Uh, uh, for sale by only subject to. So it was several di different modules in there. So it took me about three weeks to go through because I didn't know what I needed to learn. I just thought I needed to learn all of it. I was on information overload. I went from knowing nothing about it to all of these different techniques that the majority of people have never heard of and probably never will. But if I didn't get anything out of it, what really attracted me was wholesaling because it didn't take any money to do it. And plus I can be in and out of the deal. And also what attracted me is that how I can get leads is through just having people to call me if I do, did an effective job of marketing and advertising. And he mentioned bandit signs. And so um, I bought some bandit signs. I overpaid for my, I spent $250 on 50 signs, which is drastically overpaying, but I didn't know at the time. I didn't know any better. I got them on a Friday. I put them out on a Sunday morning. And the very first two calls I got that next day on Monday were uh, lead, were, were deals. One of them was a lease option opportunity, and the other one, the other one was a wholesale opportunity. And so, um, on the lease option opportunity, uh, the guy inherited a property from his mom. It had a mortgage. He didn't live in the house, and the property that he lived in uh, had a mortgage, so he couldn't afford to make both payments. So uh, he owed too much for it to be a wholesale transaction, but it was great for a lease option opportunity, even though it wasn't the greatest of neighborhoods and, and it needed a few repairs, but it was definitely definitely uh, livable. And plus I was so green, I just was just uh, happy someone even called me. Okay, so, so then um, I explained to him the process of a lease option uh, that I was gonna take over the payments I was going to charge a tenant. I was going to place a tenant buyer in there that's going to probably take a couple of years to get financed to cash him out. And how I was going to make my money, I was going to charge the tenant a couple hundred dollars or more over the, the mortgage payment. Uh, and I was going to get a down payment, a non-refundable down payment from them. So he was fine with that as long as he got relieved out of debt. Advertised the property, this lady stepped forward. And uh, she looked at the property and she was interested. So I was asking 5000 down. So she gave me five, a fifty one hundred dollars bill sitting in an old Charlie's on uh, I've been saying Center Point Parkway, but it's Parkway East in Birmingham. Do you all that are familiar with it? Which is not there anymore. I think it's a Mexican restaurant there now. But um, anyway, so um, it needed a few repairs. So the guy that actually owned the property, he was a handyman, which we through our conversations he mentioned. So I was just trying to create a win 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 for everyone. And I mentioned that he could do the repairs that she wanted on the house. And so he um, uh, agreed to do it. So he also, I had a friend of mine when I was on the job that I was working, he did mortgages on the side. And so uh, I mentioned that the guy wanted to get a, uh, his house refined, one, re refinanced the house that he was living in. So again, I was trying to create a win, win, win. So my friend mentioned to him that, uh, I had found a tenant buyer and they had already given me $5,000. He went crazy because he felt that I should have given him at least half of that. And I explained to him, all of that is mine. I'm relieving him of his debt. 
and keeping his credit from being ruined or the property being taken, a combination or whatever the situation was. So when he met the lady over there to uh, to uh, discuss uh, doing the repairs for her, he he told the lady that to get off her property, he was going to call the police. Tyrone did not own this property, blah, blah, blah. So the lady called me crying she, because she felt she had been scammed. And so I told her uh, wherever she was at, I would meet her with her $5,000, even though I had spent $700. I had to come up with that. I wouldn't, you know, had the money to come up, but I did. I don't remember what I did to do it. But anyway, so I met her, gave her her money. I called the seller. He and I got into a heated argument. And uh, last words to me that he said, if he ever saw me, it wasn't going to be pretty or something to that effect. So uh, that deal blew up in my face. So most people, you'll be out of this stuff doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Blah, blah, blah. I was fortunate. Uh, the other call that I had were two sisters. Their mom left them a property. And uh, like a lot of people, we're not going to sell mom's property. We have too many memories here. You know, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, they uh, got tired of uh, renting out to relatives, tearing up the property, not paying them, and so on, and they decided to sell it. They were motivated to sell. So they uh, called me. We agreed on $20,000. I didn't even know if that was a deal or not. It just sounded like, well, I didn't. I, I still was green. I, I didn't know, you know, but fortunately, that was a good price for me. I advertised the property. This uh, real estate agent called me, said, yeah, I had a client, a cash buyer that was interested in properties in that area. And so uh, we agreed on 25,000, but you know, I explained to the realtor up front, I was wholesaling, explained the process. So he said in order to, uh, to, uh, to stir his, send his buyer that way, he would want half of that. So instead of me making 5,000 on my first deal, I only made 2,500. So I met them in a uh, shopping center parking lot, gave them, uh, he, he gave me a 5,000, I'm sorry, $500, Earnest money to check. Next 10 days, we closed on it. Boom, that was my first deal, March 5th, 2003. I made $2,500. Not a lot of money, uh, but it, it was a lot of money for me. Uh, it, might, it might as well have been um, $250,000 because I had failed at so many businesses before that and so many things I thought were going to be just great ideals, but this actually worked. Um, and I, I like to go through that because I don't, it, it was easy for me, but there were some challenges there. When I say easy, it's easier than, than what it may be for others. And I've had students to close even quicker than that, but you know, that's going to vary from just a lot of factors that go into being able to put deals together that fast. So, um, I'm not, I'm from a small town. I'm no smarter than you are. Well, what may make me a little different is that I take action. I'm not afraid to do it. If I think I got the resources and I have a general understanding on what I'm doing, I'm, I'm all in. But what I've discovered is that obviously there's a hard way of doing this and there's a, a more simple way of doing it. I hate to use the word easy, but there's a more simple way of doing this. Uh, like many of you, you think you um, need tons of money. Real estate as, as entrepreneur, newer minded as I was, real estate wasn't even a consideration because I thought uh, you needed tons of money to actually do deals. And I soon found out that that, that you don't, but uh, most people think they have to have a real estate license. I don't tell people not to get one, but I, tell, I let them know that you don't need one because I still don't have one. I really have never even considered it. Um, Waiting until you figure out everything totally. I was full of information, but everything was so vague with me. You're not going to get it all. Some of it just gonna come from flat out trial and error. It just is, it, it just is. You know, if you figure, try to think you're gonna know everything before you get started, cause some stuff just gonna come up that you can't be trained for. Now, of course, not to get on my soapbox with my training or whatever, I'm more or less the coaching, that's why I can feel in holes for you because I can train you all day, but some stuff is going to come up and just from experience, you'll just know how to handle it. Uh, I'm not a book reader, but a lot of people like to read books. Most books, they're just upsells. I'm not hating on them, but they're just are. Most of you can uh, agree with that. You know, they're the, just vague, you know, and some people may be uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, 
uh, maybe if we're already familiar with it or whatever and can figure it out. But in most cases, they're just uh, they're just upsells. All right. Now, uh, I had a job, you know, before I, when I started doing this, I didn't hate my job. I just wanted more. Now, I don't know what your situation may be, but that, that, that was mine. Uh, I didn't hate it, but I just wanted more. Uh, taking pointless business classes in college. Uh, that's me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the poster boy for that. I ended up with a history degree of business administration minor. Long story on that. I got so deep in the business classes and I wasn't really doing that well. When I see my advisor, she said, hey, all your electives are in history. Why don't you pursue a history grade? You're going to finish in a year and a half. I said, sign me up. <laughs> so it was more important with me. I wouldn't give anything for my college years because it helped me grow up as a man and just experience a lot of stuff that I would have never experienced coming from the small town that I came from. But as far as what it's done for me, as far as providing income, very little, you know, just very little. But again, I wouldn't give anything for it. But just the way the educational system is set up, it teaches you how to go get a job in most in most universities, not how to create your own opportunities or whatever. So going to some seminars, even after I was doing deals, I was going to seminars. Uh, now, I wasn't ever signing up, you know, because I was just looking for another way to find deals. I understand the process. Like, again, I was already doing deals. But I had went to a seminar and whew, probably... Uh, probably 10 years at least, if not longer. Uh, but uh, again, I was just going to see what are they doing different than I'm doing. I found out they really wasn't doing anything more different than I was doing. But so, but again, uh, and then the last bullet point here, giving myself information overload. A lot of you can speak to that. Uh, that was my situation. But again, um, I took action. Wholesaling stuck to me out of all the information and techniques that I learned. Again, don't let me forget about the two free courses. We're going to go ahead and get to what you're here for tonight is how to wholesale apartments with no cash or credit. This is different. Uh, the same once you get a buyer and seller in place, but how you go about it, uh, a lot of it is different than houses. Uh, and so we're going to get into some of the things on, 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 on what it's all about. Why wholesale apartments? Well, the simple question is why not? And, and most of the time that just comes from most people not understanding uh, what to do in the sense of how to find a deal, what makes a deal, how to evaluate it, uh, where does the money come from? What about the large uh, earnest money deposits that could be uh, a problem and so on. So that creates uh, some uh, people being afraid and intimidated with just the sheer numbers. Now, Apartments are all over the board, similar to houses, in the sense that you can have a, a seven-unit building and they may only want eighty grand for it. Just depend on what part of town, the condition, uh, how many are rented or whatever. But then it could get ridiculous. You know, you could be it could be an apartment building that's seven units, and depending on what part of the country you're in, and that building may be a four or five hundred thousand dollar building or even more. So that that's going to be relative to the market that you're dealing in. And along with other factors, but why wholesale apartments? Like with any any of this, number one, you're in it for the money, all right. And what what it can provide as far as financial freedom for you, and options that it can provide. Um, another thing is that uh, is that with apartments, as I'll go through this, uh, the the biggest thing that I like is that the there's no competition in in the sense, and if you compare it to houses. Because most people don't understand it. No, most people don't know what process they need to go through to, to actually get to a check. So I'm going to go through some of that. So, so let's compare the two houses versus apartments. All right. As I said, it's low competition. You know, everybody named Mama has uh, videos, and I guess that includes me, uh, on how to wholesale houses on YouTube and other places, but mainly YouTube. It's very little information out there on apartment buildings and multifamily. Uh, so you're going to have low competition in the sense that uh, you'll send a letter to an actual property owner or make a call to a property owner. And you're the only one that has called them out of the blue asking to sell their property. You know, that's 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 enough in itself to to consider looking into wholesaling apartments just by itself. Just the low competition. 
uh, easier to do virtually. Um, a lot of people want to do houses virtually or whatever. I always encourage my students to start in your backyard first uh, as far as trying to wholesale houses because there are several factors there that it just makes it so difficult to do it if you're not there. The main thing is, is keeping the seller and the buyer apart from each other. Now, if you have someone on the ground in a different market that you can trust, then you can accomplish that with ease. But uh, the main thing is just keeping the seller because the, there's, it's rare on houses that a buyer, especially most buyers are going to be local and the seller is going to be local on houses. It's going to be rare that they don't want to see the property before they buy it. Whereas with apartments, it's a possibility that they never visit the property. That's just the way it is. Um, but uh, the main thing with houses, that, that's the most difficult, keeping the seller and the buyer prop and you being closed out of the deal, even if you have a contract, because the seller could literally just wait you out to the contracts and, and just delay. Now, obviously, there's a course of law that you can sue for anything, but I'm just telling you the difficulty, but it costs you money to do that. So, all right, so uh, nationwide buyer. Uh, basically what I'm talking about, uh, which the apartment, the building that I advertised earlier in this webinar, uh, I doubt that we probably find a buyer to in that market. We will probably end up having a buyer that's outside of that actual market. You know, whereas with houses, again, you can have out of town buyers because I've had them and I'm sure some of the people that have done deals on the call may have had them. But normally your buyer will come from a local, uh, from, from local to the actual property. Whereas with multifamily, especially the larger the, the property is, the more extended, uh, the more uh, nationwide that you can go as far as looking for buyers. If it's just a four unit, five unit or so on, then, you know, normally that may come local. But again, it just depends. If it's in South Florida and in X neighborhood, yeah, it still could attract buyers nationwide, more so than a house in that same neighborhood if it was four and it come. So, that's another thing that makes it more attractive, you know, nationwide buyers, similar to triple net, which triple net really uh, properties, which that's what the flip this building, but I'm not getting off track here, but they really, you really are dealing with nationwide buyers for the most part on pretty much any deal if it has a national tenant, but not to get sidetracked. All right, so obviously bigger paydays. Now, when you start talking about apartments, again, they're all over the, they're all over the place. Like that's a uh, seven unit, $70,000 property. Uh, just say if it was rented and it was in decent condition, it may be worth 200 grand. Uh, but you make and make 15, 20 on it. Whereas if it's in a different market and you can get it worth 500 with, uh, uh, but you can get it for 300, you may be able to make 75, 80 grand on it. So what you can make is all on the board. But the, the great thing about it is just that because that, that potential to make an, a, a, an extreme amount of money is there is, is a great reason and definitely why I do it on why I target apartments. Uh, outside of the low competition, uh, you can do it virtually. Uh, dealing with nationwide buyers, bigger paydays. All right, so the process, uh, knowing what's a deal, all right? Uh, that's just like with houses. That's a huge part of it. Now, the difference with apartments are because it's an income producing property and most of your buyers, they're not buying to resell. And even if they are, they still normally on a, a 12 month to a, a minimum of 12 months. Uh, but a lot of times they'll do a two year, three, a two to three year plan. And just to be, it, buy a property with some value add get it rented, get it renovated, and they flip it. Now, that does happen, but it's not like a house you buy and hope to flip it within 60 to 90 days. Whereas with apartments, most of the time, the buyers are looking to hold a property because they're looking for the income that it will produce. All right, so knowing what's a deal obviously is important, but the reason I bring that up is that whereas with houses, you have to have them deeply discounted. With apartment building, it doesn't work that same because it's so income-driven that you don't have to have a, a, a property just deeply, deeply discounted to make a nice payday. So knowing what's a deal is very important. And we'll get into, you know, some of the factors on, on that. But uh, knowing what's a deal, like with any real estate deal, knowing what's a deal, what's not a deal. All right. So how to locate these deals. All right. 
Now, uh, locating apartment deals, bandit signs are not going to get it. <laughs> Trust me, I tried it. <laughs> not one call put out. Uh, I don't know how many I ordered that time, but ooh, I learned that the I think at least 100. Not one call, and they stayed up a good amount of time. Not one call. Bandit signs are not going to get it, at least from my experience. Maybe maybe you have to do it longer, but at least from my experience, bandit signs didn't work. The signs actually said, we buy apartment buildings, phone number, no calls. Now, direct mail works really well. It actually works better on apartments, from my experience, even with houses. Because as I said, whereas with people with houses, they may be getting bombarded with letters, you know, from all different angles. Whereas with apartments, it is 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 less likely that someone reaches out and say, hey, "I want to buy your apartment building." All right. Now, another way to locating deals is is speaking with property managers. On, on, and, and let me back up. Uh, off, which I'll get to that in a second. But off market is very important when you're wholesaling apartment buildings. Um, it can be done done on a listed property, but it's better for it to be off market, you know. So I just want to I just want to bring that up. It makes it easier. You can do both, but it makes it easier. Okay, so uh, property management uh, companies, you can contact them and see if they have a client that's ready to sell. It may not be advertised for sale, but they know. Now you may have to give them some incentive to uh, to make that happen, or at least uh, put that in motion as far as you being interested in buying the property, but property management uh, companies is another target. Uh, obviously, you could contact realtors. Uh, you could contact agents nationwide and see if they have anything off market. You know, obviously, if they have something listed, they're going to ready, be ready to shove that, uh, shove that in your face. So you have to make a judgment call. Again, it can be done, but you have you, it's just a couple of few things that you just have to know how to do. I normally don't recommend it to my students to go that route because it can be so discouraging when you have a listed property, you know, because wholesaling, the reason that it'll work effectively and quickly is because you have control. Whenever you target properties that are already advertised, you lose some of that control. Again, I'm not saying that you can't do deals like that. It just makes it more difficult, in my opinion, in my experience. All right, now evaluating the deal, which is simpler than knowing what is a deal, but you have to, even if you have an opportunity uh, to see if you have a deal or not, you, you have to know how to evaluate a deal. Apartment buildings, multifamily uh, are purchased in two ways, and maybe in a combination of these. is based on the cap rate and per door. All right, the cap rate is short for capitalization rate. Think of it in terms of what you will get a return on your money, your investment. If you put money in a bank, you're going to get 1%, 2%. All right. So for most, I don't know, I'm not going to say most, but for a lot of apartment owners, uh, people that pursue those, they're, they're just simply looking for the return on their money on what they have invested in the deal. So 7, 8, 10, Obviously, they can get 15%. That's that's just look at it as interest. That's the money that you would get a return on. So capitalization road, just do a little homework on it. So that's what they're looking on, the return on their investment. So depending on the market that you're in, if you're in, we'll just say in most normal markets, if an investor can get a, a well, now obviously you're going to have, and, and I should have put this in here. I forgot to do it. I forgot to do it. But you're going to have different grades of properties. You're going to have an A, B, C, D. All right, obviously, you know what a deep property is. That's going to be in the, the uh, quote-unquote rougher areas or the hood. All right, A properties are going to be in the best part of town and the apartments exist. So now B and C, obviously C is closer to D. B is closer to A. So I, hopefully I explain that. And sometimes it, 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 it matters on what year the property was built and all that stuff to, to determine the grade of the property. But just as a quick definition, obviously, you know, the D's are the, the little rough areas or the hood or some people may call them war zone. Those are going to normally be D properties. The A property is going to be the best part of your market and the apartments exist. Whereas B's and C's 
you can just figure out which direction you're going in. So that's a part of it too. So the cap rate, if you're in an A, if you're in an A part of town, the cap rate may be only four or five percent, uh, especially depending on what city you're in, or it may be six or seven percent. Whereas with a D property, normally they're going to be over ten percent, sometimes 15, 20 percent. You know, so and then B and C, they'll just fit in somewhere in there, depending on the market. I had to explain that because that the A, B, C, and D factors in greatly on what cap rate a, an investor is expecting on a particular property. Okay, so on the per door, now you'll have some, most of the investors don't operate like this, but you'll have some that like to buy per, per door. And they'll base that on what other properties sold for in the area and they compare just like similar to a house and comps on a house. So they may say, it may be a hundred unit building and they, and you know, recent sales show that they sold for 15,000 per door. So if my math is correct, what a hundred, uh, what is that? Uh, hundred door, a hundred, a hundred times. What is that? Is that, uh, what is that? Is that, is that 10, is that 1.5 million or 15 million? Whatever it is, I, mean, I don't have my math, but, that that's what that's what the price of the property would be. Let me do one that's easy. Ten <laughs> uh, uh, a ten unit building at fifteen thousand a door is a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Let me do one of these so that you so you can get the math. So they may base it on that uh, versus versus the cap rate, and then some people may do a combination of both before they fact and make a decision on whether it's going to be something they want to invest in or not. So. All right, so let's get into the cap rate and all that stuff because it's, it's so important on understanding that. How do you derive a cap rate? I, I wish I would have put some numbers here, but we're too late now. But how do you derive a cap rate? Uh, so you have the NOI. And as you see that at the bottom uh, of, of this list here, net operating income. And uh, the NOI is divided by price to give you the cap rate. That'll give you the percentage that we're talking about. So normally the NOI is smaller than the price. So if you had an NOI, we'll just say of $100,000 and the price was uh, a million. So I'm, it, and the price was a million. So the cap rate would be 10%. I just did some easy math. So I know that's 10%. All right. So well, how do you come up with the NOI? So you take the gross income, which is normally rents and maybe include a laundry room or something like that or a snack machine. But you take the gross income annually and subtract the gross expenses annually. So the gross expenses could be taxes, insurance, uh, management fee. Um, I guess you could do improvements and repairs. Sometimes people take that out when they're evaluating. Uh, garbage pickup, are they paying part of the water or any of the utilities? So uh, administration fees, all of that stuff can add up to expense. So you subtract that from the income and that gives you the NOI, the net operating income. So once you have the net operating income on a property, you had a net operating income on the property and you know the price, then you can determine the cap rate. Now you can go back and watch this video again. I'll have uh, the full version up of this flipinar, and then a couple of days later, or whatever, I had a short version. So you can go back and go through this and you can do your own due diligence on that. But this is very important in understanding that cap rate and how you get to that point. All right. So negotiating. Um, obviously you can pay, someone can pay cash for it. They can have a loan and then you, you can do owner financing. What you'll find with, uh, with, uh, commercials and or obviously multifamily that a lot of owners will be interested in owner financing sometimes with nothing down. If you can find the right deal and structure it the right way, the right way to their benefit, because a lot of times they don't want, they, they're, they're going to sell the property for whatever, whatever reason. But if they can owner finance it, they can delay the taxes on it because they haven't officially sold it because uh, you're you're making payments on it. Well, now it's a cash deal that speaks for itself. If it's a loan, that's a process, you know. So now you have a lender involved and they have to approve certain things. Obviously, the buyer has to qualify for that lender and so on. So you're negotiating techniques. I want the uh, when you're dealing with cash, that's one thing. If someone wants to give you a price, you accept that. Now. Uh, if you're going to set up the deal initially with owner financing, you have to make sure that you set up the owner financing where you're going to get paid up front. The way I normally like to do it, 
Uh, we may negotiate a deal with the price of the property. We'll just use some easy numbers. Here's a hundred thousand dollars. He wants ten percent down, so that's ten grand. So I may advertise the property, and we'll just say a um, hundred and twenty-five thousand. And I may, but but in order for me to get paid, I need to get paid out of that down payment. So I need to make up the difference. So um, I may say the uh, the down payment is twenty five thousand dollars. So in order to get back down to the hundred, and I keep fifteen of that, and the seller gets his ten, we get back down to the hundred. If I'm a man, just trying to do that off the top of my head, I may be a little wrong there, but so. That's the way I do it. Now, there's some other creative ways to do it, but I'm going to increase the down payment and the price in order for me to get paid if some owner financing is available, which you always, if that's an option, whenever you're negotiating and, and the price is not ridiculous, by any means, because people will pay more if they can get into a property via, I mean, buyers is what I'm referring to. If they can get into a property via owner financing, and uh, obviously, you know, the down payment will factor in the terms in the sense of interest rate, how long, and all of those factors. You know, I've had uh, uh, some older owners, you know, they don't even care about the interest rate. You know, they just want a shorter term. So a lot of times people do some owner finance and they can refi and cash out with a, a traditional loan from a lender, you know, within a two to three or a less than five years time, sprint, time frame. So there's just a lot of options there, which that helps you with negotiating your deal, whether you're dealing with cash, um, or you think you're, you're going to deal with a buyer that needs a loan, or if you can get owner financing in place, and then you basically you assign the owner financing if you do a good job of that. All right, contract without EMD up front. Now, uh, I have techniques that I use to do that. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, because I'm just letting you know it's possible uh, to do it. Uh, and it's all just like with anything else. Uh, most, uh, most won't especially with real estate, but enough will. Most won't, but enough will to get you paid and change your fi your financial situation. All right, now, once you have it under contract, now you need to locate buyers. All right, obviously, the simple thing to do is just simply advertise the property. And if I advertise on Craigslist or even put signs out in the market or whatever, I never include the address on any of my videos. I mean, like uh, on any of my YouTube videos or um, or if I post a list on Craigslist, I'll make it simple for them to obtain the address with the information that they want. Because once buyers start to respond to you, then uh, the first thing they're going to want to see is the rent rolls uh, uh, and the last couple of years of financials, if not more. And what I mean by financials, they want to see the profit and loss statements. They want to see what the property has been doing over the last couple of years. And the reason they want to see the rent rolls, which the rent rolls are basically, and I should have put those phrases in here, but I can explain them though. They want they they want to see the rent rolls because that identifies, uh, well, it identifies the the units, and you have what they call unit mix, which simply means how many three bedrooms, how many two bedrooms, how many ones, and so they call that unit unit mix. But the rent rent rolls identify the unit. If it's vacant or occupied, if it's occupied, what they're paying, is there a, do, uh, uh, a, um, a deposit on file for that particular tenant? And how much time do they have on their lease, whether they're on month to month or whatever the situation? All right. So that's important to uh, investors or potential buyer is the rent rolls. As I said, the profit and loss statement that just tells you how much money is coming in and what's going out. You know, that helps to determine the NOI, obviously which gives you the cap rate. All right, as I mentioned before, off-market versus listed. Now, you could do both. I just prefer off-market because it just gives you, it gives you more control. All right, uh, and what I mean by that, if a property is already being advertised and depending on who you're dealing with, if that property is already being advertised, there's a strong possibility once the, the buyer does his due diligence and just simply Googles the address, Whoever has that property advertised, or whether it's a listing or if it's the owner or whoever, there's a strong possibility they can find that, that particular listing and contact them, and it could possibly blow up your deal. So now closing the deal. Okay, so um, now assuming that you have your seller, assuming you have your buyer. Now, a lot of, just like with houses, as I mentioned before, a lot of times that's dictated by your buyer. 
Uh, the only thing you want to know is who's handling the closing, putting the closing together, and you give instructions from there because you have both contracts in place. If there are any issues with you getting paid being an assignment fee, uh, depending on the deal, there are other ways to go about it. Normally, if the buyer's gotten that far, he wants a deal, they'll work with you. You know, and, and the main reason is that uh, they want more deals. That's that's the way it is. Again, anything can blow up in your face, but trust me. Once it gets to that point, everybody is getting what they wanted out of the deal, and you move forward. All right, so um, that ends the whole how to wholesale apartment. So I wanted to just get into uh, some numbers here. On most people are here uh, because they want to change the situation. I just want to get into some numbers on what type of money can be made wholesaling. Uh, real estate, mainly houses. So three to five deals per month will change most people's situation, their financial situation and change it quickly. To accomplish that, just from my experience, uh, you must talk to three to five sellers per day through your marketing efforts or through uh, just out there grinding, just contacting landlords for sale by owner, or even real estate agents. But I like to title myself in my mind as a marketer more so than a wholesaler slash investor. My job is to get up every day and let people know I exist, that I want to buy real estate. That's it. You know, if I do an effective job of that, I can eat well and people that I care about can eat well and you could do the same. So this, and we're talking about houses here. Now, we're not talking about apartments here because these numbers will be a lot larger. But with a house... Um, if you did one deal per month and you average five to seven thousand dollars per deal, which is a very conservative number, and that's going to at least be the bare minimums for most markets. And a lot of other markets, that number is double that and even more. Uh, but we're just going to go with the bare minimums here. So five to seven thousand dollars per deal, that's 12 deals per year over a 12 month period. That's 60 to 84 thousand dollars per year. Let's just go up to two deals per month, five to seven thousand per deal, twenty-four in a year. That's one hundred and twenty thousand, one hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars per year. For most people, that's got that's a game changer. The sixty to eighty-four is a game changer for. So let's get a little bit more ambitious. Five deals per month. That's five to seven deals per. Uh, uh, five to seven thousand per deal. That's sixty in a year. That's three hundred thousand to four hundred twenty thousand dollars per month. As I always say, now they know your name at the bank. Now we're going to get into the question and answer period of the of the situation of the uh, of the flipinar. Don't let me forget about the two free courses that I'll give away. Um, but uh, don't forget about the two hundred free videos I have on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe there. Uh, turn on the notifications so you can get the alerts when I upload new uh, videos to YouTube, along with uh, when I go live on YouTube. All right. Uh, text the word uh, contract to three one three one three one if you want a free copy of the contract that I've used for more than 14 years to wholesale houses with. Don't text me. Text the, the number 313131. No area code is needed. Text those six numbers, those six digits, to and, and include the word contract and send, and you'll get instructions from there. Remember, you can follow me on Instagram, flipman.net. You can follow me on Twitter, the Flipman. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Turn on the notifications. If you need proof of funds, you're going to deal with real estate agents. It's the only way they're going to take you serious. Realpof.com. That's realpof.com. Um, I use it. Go to the site. Submit your phone number. Next page. You're going to listen to Keith Yackett going to what's offered there. Submit your name and uh, email. Boom. You'll see what's going on there. All right. PrivateMoneyList.net. Um, it speaks for itself. 400 private money lenders. 40,000 cash buyers list. Boom. All right, so let's get back to the question and answer period. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here. And then I'm going to go here. And so now if you asked a question earlier, um, obviously I was going through everything. So uh, just um, 
uh, just reacts to questions. So let me let me start here. Someone asked, uh, how many apartments have you flipped in a six month period? Mm, I've been doing apartments since 06. I didn't start out that way. So that's a good question. I have to think about that. Um, I've been doing them 10 years, so I'm, I'm not even sure. Um, good question. I have to think about it. Someone said I'm lost. Are you still on page 25? <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're, we're beyond that now, so I'm sorry. Uh, not sure about the name, Valerie. All right. Uh, earnest money deposit. Um, I'm not sure what the question is there. Uh, can you go into more detail about the proof of funds? Because when I tried, it seemed like it just sent uh, me to a video. Yeah, that's what it, that's what it did. You have to it send you to a video. The guy that offers the service, keep yakking, just submit your name and phone number. It'll, it'll, it's going to tell you, well, he's going to explain to you exactly what it is. Um, I use both the approval funds and the private money list. Um, so just listen to the video. He's going to go into great de de detail about it. I don't have any questions. I don't have any questions, but I comment. I just want to say that these said webinar, but I'm going to say flipinar, are very informative, and I learn a lot listening and watching your YouTube videos. Thank you, Laverne Anthony, I think is the name. Uh, someone says, please explain NOI again. It means net operating income. Camilla, think of it in terms of you have, you know what you make, the income, and you subtract the expenses. That's all it is. Or we'll just use just some simple math here. If you made uh, $50,000 in sales, but your expenses to attain those sales were, um, we'll just say $30,000, then your net operating income would be $20,000. In terms of rent, say you're collecting over the course of a year, you collected uh twenty. I'm sorry, uh fifty thousand dollars in rent total, and um your expenses were thirty thousand dollars. That leaves twenty thousand dollars. The twenty thousand dollars would be your net operating income. All right. Someone says. Uh, someone said, "What should I have in place before getting coaching?" Uh, nothing but uh, a willingness uh, to, to to get going in action because you can go through my information in um, in a few hours. You know, there's no fluff there. You you know, there's no fluff. I tell you exactly what to do, and once you go through the the actual training, then we're ready to get your uh, get your emotion. You know, whether you're using free mo me methods or you're uh, creating a marketing camp campaign or a combination of both, which I highly recommend. All right, says uh, Tanji Lee, uh, working with little to no funds for marketing. Uh, can a motivated person still contact potential sellers via Craigslist? Well, Tanji, I w yeah, you could do that, but not in the sense that you think. Um, now, you have to have thick skin uh, if you're going to do it that way because you're going to get a lot of no's. I don't care what form of marketing or, um, or uh, farming you do as far as trying to find leads you got to have thick skin and understand that the majority of people that you talk to they're not going to be deals it that's just the way it is uh so to answer your question yes but i wouldn't target the for sale by owner section as much as i would target people that are trying to to uh, rent properties um out uh landlords you're, you're targeting tired possibly tired landlords and whenever you contact them, you ask them if the property is still available and um, uh, whether, it is, whether it is or not, you, you let them know that um, uh, you're interested. Well, you simply ask them a question, would they be interested in selling the property? And you go from there. Uh, if they are, fine, you take the information. Uh, if they're not, you want to always ask them, do they have any other properties that they would be interested in selling? 
So you can do that through any uh, places online that you see that are uh, have listings from from landlords. Now you'll have property management companies that have listings there along with real estate agents that are representing the actual owner. You know, your goal is you can deal with them, but it's going to be more difficult to find deals that way because they, you know, you're basically taking a property from under their management, which is money. So it may be a little bit more difficult to do it that way. But um, um, so your your goal is to talk to private owners. Another thing you could do is target uh, for rent signs, um, you know, just the generic red and white signs or the white and black signs that say for rent. You know, normally those are private owners. And, you know, same thing. You call them, see if they're interested in selling. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, all right. For apartment buildings, would the buyer or the due diligence, would the buyer do due diligence uh, before signing? Some will, some won't. Some will sign and then they'll have a uh, due diligence period in the contract and that's where they'll do their due diligence. So it'll just depend on the... Uh, on the actual buyer, whether they want to do di di to perform due diligence before they enter into an agreement or not. Um, all right, someone says, uh, when you put a property on the contract that has a tenant, what is the best way to get the seller for, get the best way to get the seller for inspection? Um, that's going to vary, man, because sometimes a, a seller won't want the tenant disturbed at all. And, um, and then sometimes they don't care. They'll just go in and knock on the door and boom, hey, and we come to look at the property. So that's going to vary. So if it's a situation, it, in my experience and what I've done in the past, if it was a situation where I can't show the property, it has to be even cheaper because my buyer is not going to be able to see it either. So he's going to have to make a judgment call. Hey, I want this property without seeing the inside of it. Obviously it's somewhat livable if someone's living there. So it's going to have to be even cheaper if that's the situation. But if you can view the property and normally if I get inside of a property, I'm going to video it. So that'll eliminate a lot of in and out on it or whatever. So, um, but it can be done, but it's just going to depend on what the seller and, and, and what, what his expectations are on you being able to view the property while you have it on the contract. All right, someone says, have you ever experienced complaints from banded signs? I just uh, began marketing using signs and have gotten a few complaint calls. Oh yeah, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not over the 14 year period. Uh, as many banded signs I've put out, I've gotten probably less than 10 complaints over that time frame. Now, it also depends on, are you putting them in areas where they already exist? Or are you trying to put them in areas where you think you want to live in the suburban areas? That's the way most markets are set up. Uh, that matters. You know, um, banner signs are not new. Now, if you go, I don't know what city you're in, but if you scour your entire city, uh, and sometimes you have to get out, well, not something, you got to get outside of your com comfort zone and you don't see any banded signs, then yeah, that may be an issue of putting them out, but you still can get outside of the uh, the city limits and get out into the county. You have to be creative. You know, you just have to be creative. I, I don't know what else to tell you that. So, but the, the first thing is, do they exist anywhere in your market? If they do, that's probably where you're gonna have to place them also. I know everybody wants to put them where theirs are the only one in a particular area, but a lot of times that's not an option. It's just not. Someone says, is there somewhere online where I can download your one-page contract? Well, I gave the information about the text option, but you can go to my site, flipman.net, enter your phone name and phone number, and it'll give you an option there. Flipman.net, as you saw on the screen. Do you buy and hold or fix and flip? Uh, I've done it all. Uh, in the mode that I'm in right now, just straight wholesaling. But I've done both. The, the the way to true wealth in real estate though you got to buy and hold that 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 cash flow that's coming in whether you know you're sick or whatever that's that's always should be someone's goal at some point i i just it, I'm, I'm weird that way so don't go by what i do in that sense um i'm just reading this before i read it out
All right, someone said, uh, I went to look at a property yesterday that was in such bad condition. I don't think anyone would, would want to buy it. Should I even make a low ball, uh, a low ball, I guess, offer to the seller or not even waste my time with the seller? Uh, with the seller, I'm not interested in a low ball offer. Um, I'm assuming you're saying the seller is not interested in a low ball offer. Now, it depends on what type of neighborhood it is. You know, what else is around? Is it, is it the only house that looks that way uh, in that area? Um, you know, you know, there's several factors that go into that. Um, so my best deals have been houses that have just been horrible. But it, it was the zip code, the street there that it was on, you know, and, and hey, cha-ching. You can't get it. You can't get too caught up in that. You know, those are several factors that go into that. All right, so hi, Ty. Uh, it says, uh, where have you had the most success in your market? In the war zones, working class, or upper upper class area? Uh, well, overall in the war zones, you know, but it's not like that now. Um, I saw it have to be in the, in the uh lower middle class or middle class and obviously if i can get something in the upper middle class that's a home run but those are harder to come by um uh what are the steps in negotiating deals with sellers someone said price now i'm not a haggler you know so i just have a a, a, a same step that i always use I'm just going to, my goal is always to get the seller to give me their least amount uh, versus me trying to give them an offer and making them accept it or convincing them to accept it. But that's just me. Um, so, but that, the, but to answer your question, uh, and it's in my train, I think I have it out there somewhere, so it's not like it's a secret, but, you know, I always ask the question, you know, that I was trained to do and still use it 14 years later, paying all cash. They're closing quickly. What's the least amount you'll accept? Wait on the response. Regardless of what they say, you always ask, is that the best you can do? Now, sometimes sellers won't give you a price. Make me an offer. So if I'm forced into making an offer, I'm going to make an offer that I'm so embarrassed about, I'm normally going to be low enough. Now, I'm not expecting them to accept it, and sometimes they may even hang up on you. They were, they were not motivated anyway. But um, if they say, no, I can't take that, you know, my follow-up question will be, well, how close can you come to that amount? Again, my goal is to find out what their lowest amount is. Now, if that's a number I can work with, we move forward. If it isn't, I thank them for their time. Let them know if anything changes, please give me a call back. Sometimes they call back, maybe six months later. But that's no, my normal process of negotiating with houses. Uh, have you ever advertised a property online like Craigslist that you don't have under contract just to see if anybody? Yeah, I, I do that all the time because uh, I may not be sure if there's any interest in a property at the price that I have. Yeah, I do that all the time. But I won't give them the address or anything. I'll just give a, an area or whatever, maybe a video of the property or something like that. So, yeah, I, I, I've done that. I do it all the time. I still do it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put a property out there or I may even text some buyers that I trust and um, see if they would be interested, and uh, I'll negotiate my deal from there, you know. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question. Someone says, I have a four unit on the contract for a price I feel is great and gotten a lot of inquiries, but the bad part is that it hasn't sold yet. Any suggestions? Well, if you get an action on, I don't know how long you've uh, had it on the contract, but uh, B Brown. But uh, if you're getting calls on it, you know that that's really the only thing you can do, man. Unless you're just asking too much. Um, if you're not getting any offers on it, uh, it may not be cheap enough. You know, if that's simple, uh, that's that's your market will tell you. You know, if you're in the right, uh, if you're in the right ballpark or whatever. So it may not be, it may not be cheap enough. Someone says, can you wholesale in a rural area, i.e. on a farm type homes? 
Uh, anything could be wholesale, but it all boils down to with anything else as far as commerce is uh, supply and demand. You know, what, what type of demand, meaning what type of how many buyers are actually be interested in that property. But, yeah, it can be wholesale. But, um, you know, how, how many buyers it will, will, will want the property. But in a rural area, sometimes those properties can move out because a lot of properties don't come up for sale in those areas. You have people that want to invest there just like anywhere else. So uh, opportunity could exist there. You know, it just depends. But most definitely it can happen. It just, I was just a numbers game. You know, more people, more buyers. Yeah, someone said, uh, just place an ad on Craigslist without an actual house is a ghost ad. Yeah, that, that's what he's talking about. But I was just saying, I may have a property that I'm actually uh, prospecting. And I'm not just, you know, I don't have anything in the pipeline at all. It may be an actual property that I'm prospecting. And um, I decide to um, uh, advertise it a little bit to see what type of interest is there. So that, that's that's what I meant. But I knew what he meant also, the ghost ad. All right, someone says, how many people should a beginner call or email to reach out to make a presence? Um, well, uh, if you can accomplish a goal of three, you talk to actual three property owners per day versus, versus a call or email or whatever, and you actually get a communication back, whether it's an email or a call, oh, you'll do deals. You know, But it takes a lot of patience to do it that way. Um, it, you know, again, uh, set a goal, three people a day, five a day, you know, those are turn into deals, but it takes a lot of persistency and, uh, patience to do it that way. Um, I don't know if any of you all watched the uh, movie, the founder, which is about Ray Kroc, you know, the guy that, uh, he didn't find, found, uh, find, uh, create McDonald's. It was already in existence. He just took it and made it better through some uh tech <laughs> through some techniques that might not uh everybody may not agree with it but uh persistency uh what was his his thing was he was a salesperson but I totally agree is being persistent whatever you're doing you know what I'm saying so uh obviously you want results but um you got to be persistent Someone says, when you send out a uh, mail campaign, who do you use? Uh, do you mean who sends the mail campaign out? Or what? I, I do it myself, if that's what you mean. I, I do it myself. All right, I'm going to take one more question here, if, 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 if one comes up. And then we'll give away the free courses. All right, no more, no more questions. So uh, I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook Live and YouTube Live. I really appreciate the people that are on. Tell a friend or family member. I'll try to do this again next week. Um, we had to rig it up. You know, the, the technology is not there yet to do it where I can have all of this going at once. But uh, we'll work with it. So I appreciate it, one, everyone on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Hold on a second here, enemy. I'm, I'm going to give away these free courses. Let me end these guys.
Well, YouTube is still going to be with us, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. All right, so um, All right, so I ended them. All right, so let's get to it. Program giveaway. I'm, I'm going to do it. 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 I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. My right, Harpo. Uh, let's see here. All right, so how are we going to do it? Okay. All right. Uh. Again, I appreciate everyone that comes out every week. I really do. Keeps me going on, on doing this. Okay, on the phone number side of the game, we're going to go with, let's see what we got. All right, uh, phone number is, let me make sure I jot this down here, hold on. Already then disappeared on me. Uh, the last seven numbers are, Eight nine seven four one four four. So text me from that number to two zero five four nine two three four two five two zero five four nine two three four two five. If you don't remember it, just simply go to any of my videos on YouTube. You'll see it, or go to my site flipman dot net. But two zero five four nine two three four two five, and on the chat side of the game, let me see here. All right, uh, first initial is, well, I guess uh, people see the name here, so uh, on the chat deal. So it spits out um, Shamika Dunbar. So text me, Shamika Dunbar uh, at 205 492 3425. 205 492 3425. Course winners 02 02. And that's a wrap. Really appreciate it, guys. Again, uh, join us next week. Uh, tell friends, family members. Appreciate your chance of winning, but I really appreciate everyone coming out and I'll see you on the flip side.